What's going on, everybody? Good morning. Welcome into the Farzee Show here at the Steven Singer Studios. My name is Mark Farzetta. Great show today. Ruben Frank from NBC Sports Philadelphia will join the program coming up uh, in just a couple of minutes. Rube wrote a great piece that I'll uh, reference in just a second. Uh, but first off, how about them Phillies? <laughs> Here's what I'm worried about. This is what I was worried about yesterday. I didn't mention it because I want to put the bad juju in the air. But after two very nice wins against a subpar team in the Cubs, two very nice wins, including back-to-back uh, double-digit wins, a double-digit run scored, I should say, in those two consecutive wins, uh, you go out and you lose last night's game. Uh, but after the first two games, you set up yourself pretty well to win the series. You lose game three of this series, and now you have an opportunity to botch the whole thing. Nobody wants a split with the Cubs. You want to win the series with the Cubs. And yesterday, you just put that at risk. And I was looking at the the uh, the, the game before I did the show yesterday. I was looking at the pitching matchup with Zach Wheeler on the hill. I thought to myself, hey, well, you know, there you go. You got your ace. You got your best pitcher. You got your all-star guy. A guy, as it turns out. Now it looks like he could very well start the All-Star game as Jacob DeGrom is probably not going to be traveling to go to uh, Colorado for the All-Star game this year. So that puts Zach Wheeler in line to be the starter in this upcoming All-Star game. Uh, and I was looking at it, and I was like, all right, you got Zach Wheeler on the bump. That's a good sign, right? And then I was looking at the other guy's ERA, and I was like, okay, that ERA is like 4, 6, 8. I go, uh, Wheeler is better than half that. And I was just, for whatever reason, sometimes these games just jump out to me as uh, I think we use the term in football all the time, letdown games, and this was a letdown game. You watch the first inning of this game. Didi Gregorius has an error for what should have been the second out of the inning. They almost had a put out at second base, which also would have helped you get out of the inning. Unfortunately, they weren't able to do that. And then every run that was scored in this Phillies loss, where they allowed eight runs, by the way, eight runs of the, all eight runs by the Cubs, were scored with two outs on the board and what was most nauseating it wasn't even when the bullpen came in it wasn't when uh brogdon came in and allowed the hit down the uh, left field line a lot a couple more runs to score the biggest thing that was just nauseating was that first inning with zach wheeler on the hill because there were so many opportunities there that he had he made great pitches and the cubs made adjustments they just put enough willow uh, the willow on the ball so to speak and they dinked and dunked them around the field and were able to get three runs across. And a lot, a lot some of it because of the air, some of it because they, they botched the play at second base, weren't able to get that out either. But most of it was because you were just getting dinked and dunked around the ball field. And when you get dinked and dunked like that, and you got guys going with the pitches the way they were and just making contact, putting the ball in play, and good things happen, well, good things happened yesterday. That was the most nauseating thing, was the fact that the centimeter – right? A centimeter, half of a centimeter, whatever it might have been. And they're completely missing on these pitches to begin with. So I, I actually liked what I saw from Zach Wheeler for the most part, but did he have his best stuff yesterday? Here we go again. No, yesterday, unfortunately, he did not have his best stuff. As far as this team goes with making, uh, allowing runs with two outs on the board, eight of them, by the way, with two outs on the board, Joe Girardi obviously pointed out after the game, how much of a just Man, air out of the blue, and that could be. You know, those can be demoralizing when, when those things type of things happen because you're so close to getting out of every inning. And we were tonight, and we just weren't able to do it, and that was the difference in the game. It's always unfortunate when you get that close and then you just can't get over the hump. With football, we talk about it all the time. You third down, third and seven. Oh, and there's a pass completed for eight yards. You can't get off the field. You feel like you're so close, and when you have it happen eight different times in a ball game. It's going to come raining down upon you. You know, appreciation. Because I've been I've been talking about this quite a bit. Uh, earlier in the season, I was talking about Andrew McCutcheon, not an everyday player anymore. His batting average surely isn't anything worth bragging about at this point. But yesterday, Andrew McCutcheon is fifteenth home run of the season. Fifteenth home run of the season. I remember talking to, and I told you guys about this. I hosted an event with Brad Lidge, maybe three months ago, and Lidge was like all oh, high and mighty on Andrew McCutcheon and the type of year Andrew McCutcheon was going to have. And he's only batting about 233 this year, but 15 home runs, and he hasn't been that great in left field. But if you would have told me before the season you were most likely going to get 20-plus home runs from Andrew McCutcheon, maybe 25 home runs this year from Andrew McCutcheon, I'm feeling pretty damn good about that. 
from my left fielder that I don't expect a lot from to begin with because he's getting up there in age. We all know the MVP years ago there with Pittsburgh, so we're not even looking at that. But if you would have told me that, I would have thought, man, that's surprising. I would not expect him to still have that pop left in this bat. But certainly this year so far, he has, which has been great. Also, 20 home runs by the break here with uh, Reese Hoskins. That's a nice little thing to look upon and go, all right, well, get that together, fellas. Good for you. Uh, Bryce Harper came out yesterday, and I know his headline. He had an RBI yesterday. But the headline for Bryce Harper yesterday was he said, even if he made the All-Star game, he wasn't going to go. Okay. Cool. Would have still liked you have made the All Star game, but and it wasn't in the cards this year, unfortunately. Uh, and he has obviously been dealing with injury issues. He's got 15 home runs on the season. So I am overall. You look at some of these numbers offensively for the Phils, and when you factor in some of the injury equation here, some of them are actually pretty impressive. The thing that continuously does not impress you uh, are two things. One, overall bullpen performance. Yesterday, I, I can't blame the bullpen too much for what happened yesterday. The water started coming through the floodgates uh, when your ace was on the hill. So I can't look at the bullpen and say, oh, what the hell were you guys doing? But one thing else, another thing I can look at is Reese Hoskins. And the numbers are up there when it comes to to, the power numbers. Like I said, 20 home runs so far this season already. We're not even at the all-star break yet. Four games until that happens. But this is kind of what we asked for, for Reese Hoskins for a number of years, a more aggressive Reese Hoskins. I didn't think we'd trade the on-base percentage of about 370 for an on-base percentage that's right now hovering around 310. I didn't think he'd go down that far in on-base percentage by being more aggressive at the plate. I also thought if he was going to be more aggressive at the plate, he too would be batting better than 233 on the season. And I know a lot of people always go the route of batting average doesn't matter anymore. Well, if your batting average is low, and your on-base percentage is about 40 to 50 points lower than what it used to be, and the only thing that is up considerably are your home run numbers, 20. I don't think that's a fair trade. I I, I, I like the home run numbers. It's fine. Let's party with that. All right. But when you're talking about a guy that's usually around 360, 370, 375 for an on-base percentage, and then it drops that drastically, and the batting average stays around the same, yeah, it's not a fair trade. I mean, it's, I mean, at some point, and this is what's funny. I see people that always talk about uh, Reese Hoskins as far as he's overrated. He's an overrated player. And I'm like, who's rating him high? Because when I look at Reese Hoskins, I don't see a guy that's a perennial all-star. I wish I did. I don't see a guy that's going to be in the home run race every single year. I wish he was. I know that the the 18 home runs in 11 games, whatever it was, when he started out, is absolutely insane. But or excuse me, 11 home runs in 18 games is absolutely insane. But I'm not expecting that kind of pop throughout his career. I mean, that's an ungodly rate. Nobody did that faster in baseball history than Reese Hoskins did. Maybe that's why people are still stuck on him. Oh, he's supposed to be some great player. No, that was like four or three years ago, man. I don't, I'm don't. i not looking at that anymore. That was a nice welcome to the majors, son. That's all that was. But as far as his numbers go right now, I think most people look at Reese Hoskins and say, all right, let's let's put it all together. We, we, we know you can recognize a pitch, so we know you can have that high on-base percentage. We know you can drive a pitch if you see a pitch you like, but when it comes to seeing that pitch you like and you're swinging at it, you're at 233 on the season. I don't know if the, a lot of that comes to uh, bad luck, shift, whatever you want to call it. I would expect a little bit more numbers-wise from Reese, except for that number that's just a nice number to look at and feels good and cozy is 20 home runs already on the season. So, We'll see where it ends up with Reese, but that's where they're at right now. Yesterday, Phillies lose uh, eight to five again, allowing five runs in the first two innings. I can't really look too much at the bullpen when you're looking at your starter, your ace, who put in, uh, unfortunately, a bad performance there. Uh, Ruben Frank, like I said, is going to join us in a minute here. Ruben highlighted this story, and I'll let him tell you more about it. But he wrote a story about Devontae Smith. We've got training camp just about three weeks away. And Ruben talked about Devontae Smith and the risk that's there with drafting a running back, or should be drafting a wide receiver at that point in the draft. And he, and he evaluated not just the 10th overall pick, but he also evaluated between the 5th overall pick and the 15th overall pick. So that 10-pick uh, range, if you will, 5 up, 5 down from the 10th spot in the NFL draft, uh, Ruben evaluated over the last 18 years the wide receivers that have been taken in that five to 15 range. 
He evaluated them to see how many hit, how many made Pro Bowls, how many had thousand yard receiver uh, receiving seasons and all that. And he broke it down as Ruben Frank does. The reason, and I like this, the reason he only went from 2000 to 2018 was because if he went to 2020, for instance, that doesn't give that player enough time to be in the NFL, get used to the scene, and, and or even 2019. He tried to give them a three-year gap to actually mature as a player. So he thought that was a fair thing to do for the wide receivers, and good for him. Uh, I agree with that. When it comes to this, some of the numbers I just wanted to write up for you here, because I recommend reading the article, and Ruben will tell us about it a little bit more in a second. From 2000 to 2018, 27, 27 wide receivers were taken between 5 and 15 in the NFL draft. I'd like to guess how many are still active from 2000 to 2018. There would be 10 active so far, uh, or still, I should say. Five of those players, five of the 27, five. Top 15 picks we're talking about here. From five to 15, five of them have made Pro Bowls. Only three of them have been multi-Pro Bowl wide receivers. And only 13 of them actually at least had a 1,000-yard season. One thousand yard season 13 out of 27 so Ruben's point here and this is what's funny Rube will get caught up in this because I think anyone who has to write at any point about anything uh, you you go in with with something you're you're, you're rooting for you're something you're hoping for you also go in with something that's a, you're also going with an expectation oh 27 how many would you think made the pro bowl uh I would say maybe maybe 10 made the pro bowl no 10 are active only five made the Pro Bowl. So you go in there with an expectation. You're like, oh, that's a little surprising. And then, you, again, you also go in there for what you're rooting for. Because if you watch Devontae Smith, and you watch a guy that wasn't injured in college, you watch a guy that had great success in college, you watch a guy that was shorthanded in college, you watch a guy that ran a great route tree in college, you watch him come to the professional ranks, and you go, oh, this guy should translate rather well. Well, when the history is put out in front of you, it kind of gives you a little bit of pause when thinking about the history of the wide receiver position between five and 15 in the NFL draft. Now, all of it goes out the window because Devontae Smith has no history in the NFL and he could do things that are just absolutely ungodly. But absolutely on the other side of that is the, the fear, the concern that he could do things that are drastically awful. <laughs> Devastating. A lot of hope going into the season. I know is riding on Jalen Hurts. But... When you also talk about the fact that you think he can play a little bit and at least be a decent quarterback in the NFL and not a complete bust or a waste of a pick, the other thing that you, you can be concerned about, other than the obvious thing, health, let me get that out of the way for the people that are saying, well, oh, offensive line has to be healthy, is, is Devontae Smith. If Devontae Smith is an incredible wide receiver and an easy target for Jalen Hurts, Real good things are going to happen to the Philadelphia Eagles. If Jalen Rager takes a, another step forward, you're going to be watching the Philadelphia Eagles uh, do some good things this year. And yes, if the offensive line's healthy, say it again, uh, then yeah, you're going to see this Eagles offense do a lot of good things with the talent that they'll have on that football field. And speaking of the talent, before we get to Ruben Frank, I do want to mention this. And uh, Maurice Jones Drew wrote a little list, an adorable little list of running backs in the NFL. And wouldn't you know it, Miles Sanders, I believe, fell in on uh, the 29th. 29th worst running back in the NFL. Number one, number 29, right there. Miles Sanders. Um, I know he attributed a lot to the numbers and all that. Uh, I, I I don't know if he's looked at how many times uh, Miles Sanders has ran the ball more than 20 times in the game, which... Uh, twice I believe I don't think he's ever ran the, I don't think he's ever got more than 20 carries in a football game uh, so I don't really think that you could use Doug Peterson's offense and say ah oh, that Miles Sanders oh look how much he's featured I also don't think you can look at this offensive line and say oh they've really stayed, stayed healthy for Miles Sanders eh. I, I don't know what he was going on there but that I find to be ridiculous I, I think Miles Sanders is one of the most talented running backs and see that's the thing it's not on talent it's on numbers uh, that's what he's going by, at least. But what you should be going by is if you're going to rank them and ha as far as how good they can be and how good they are, that doesn't have much to do with numbers. That has to do with skill set. That has to do with talent. And I think Miles Sanders is a pretty damn talented running back. And what I hope happens 
is that Nick Sirianni comes in here. And no, I don't think that's the NFL anymore where he's running the ball 20 times a game or anything like that. But if you can give me 20 to 25 touches a game with Miles Sanders, with Devontae Smith, with Jalen Rager, with Dallas Goddard, with Zach Ertz, who I still doubt, uh, with a healthy offensive line, then I think, again, you're going to see some good things from this offense. And let's just hope this offense uh, is, is really modeled after their head coach. High energy. That's what I'll be hoping for. Uh, let me tell you about my friend Steven Singer. Speaking of high energy, my friend Steven Singer, Steven Singer Jewelers. Here at the Steven Singer Studios, we like to send everybody to Steven Singer Jewelers. Finding that person that you want to spend the rest of your life with is great. But don't you hate all the pressure of what comes next? Of course, there's all the engagement talk, right? Uh, but then there's the uh, the pressure from uh, shopping, for shopping for that engagement ring. Hassle, haggling, finding the store to trust. You try to figure out the discounts, the sales, the coupons, the styles, and all other nonsense. But at least those are all, you know, fantastic reasons for putting it off, putting off getting engaged. This is why guys like to say they hate Steven Singer. He takes away every excuse in the book when it comes to not buying the right ring because he makes it so easy and so affordable. That's why people say I hate Steven Singer. He takes all those excuses, throws them out the window. Steven Singer is a Philly jeweler that has been making it easy to buy real diamonds for over four decades. He specializes in diamond engagement rings and has a staff of real experts, real jewelers, real people that are ready to help you find the perfect ring or gift at the perfect price. No call center, no sales, no haggling, no codes, no promos, no discounts, just every single day guaranteed perfect price. Check out Steven Singer at the other corner of 8th and Walnut, right in Philadelphia, or online at IHateStevenSinger.com. Always fast and free shipping at IHateStevenSinger.com. Coming up, uh, we got uh, Ruben Frank joining us here. And Ruben is a longtime friend of mine, known him for about 15 years. We used to do a bar event together at a place called Vesuvio uh, in South Philly with our buddy Jerry. And um, uh, I, 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 I guess it's just been too long since we did it. The last question I ask here is about the a bar that uh, we used to frequent. It's no longer around, and Ruben wouldn't you know it? Not another bar he was thinking of, but whatever. Anyway, without further ado, let's talk some Eagles football. My good friend Ruben Frank from NBC Sports Philadelphia. And joining us now on the Rothman Orthopedics guest line, my good friend from NBC Sports Philadelphia. You can read his latest article, by the way, on the My Teams app as well as NBC Sports Philadelphia. Dot com. Check it out right here. Are expectations on Eagles wide receiver Devontae Smith too high? Question mark. Uh, you can read that fine piece of journal journalism once again on the My Teams app. We welcome in Ruben Frank. What's up, Rube? What's up, Farsi? <laughs> How you doing, brother? Uh, love the piece. It, it definitely. I'm very excited. Very excited for Devontae Smith. But the piece helps put everything in perspective. Being that just because he's a you know a, a top ten pick. Or, or just because he's between 5 and 15, as you explained in the article, doesn't mean he's automatically going to be a home run. Let me ask you this, though. How confident are you he could kind of buck the trend set by Eagles rookie wide receivers, especially ones drafted by Howie Roseman? Yeah, it's not a uh, it's not a pretty sight. And, you know, it's, it's funny because the ones that got off to good starts, like Reggie Brown and Jordan Matthews, I mean, they just fizzled out. Um but, uh, you know, I mean, it's even before Howie. You go back to, like, Freddie Mitchell and Kenny Jackson. I mean, there's just – it's other than Quick, Deshaun, and Macklin. I mean, it's been um, – it's been ugly. So, uh, I, I'm really confident, Mark. I mean, I really think this kid has everything. And, um, I mean, it was weird kind of writing the story because I, I, I found myself, like, skittish now. It's like, wow, this is really – I mean – the, the numbers are scary. I mean, they are. It's like, you know, and these are top picks. And I made the mistake last time I did a story like this. I made the mistake of of going, like, pick one through ten. And so somebody on Twitter corrected me and said, you know, if you're going to make it fair, you have to make it, like, equidistant from his from him to the whatever, each, each direction. Anyway, okay. um, yeah, I mean, what is it? Like six out of the 27 guys drafted from five to 15 since 2000 have made – one Pro Bowl in their career, and only three have made uh, three or four have made more than one, um, and it's easy to make the Pro Bowl, so it's it's kind of scary. But I really do. I think this kid has everything. I think his relationship with Jalen Hurts is going to help. Um, I just think he's a special talent, and uh, I've been wrong before, but I, I just can't wait to see him get going. Yeah, I, I mean, I at least want to see that see him out there on the football field as well. Any ner any nervousness about? 
the size, the weight, the height of a guy like Devontae Smith going into the season? Yeah, I would say nervousness. I'm curious. I mean, he's never been hurt. And and the fact that, um, you know, he never missed any time in uh, in college. I'm, I'm, I'm more concerned with Landon Dickerson when it comes to staying healthy. Uh, I think this kid knows how to how to protect his body. I think he's learned, uh, you know, he never missed any time in high school either. He's, he's just been healthy. And uh, he, he's he's one of those guys you watch him play. He just never takes a big flush hit. Uh, if it means getting out of bounds instead of fighting for one more yard, um, he's smart about it, and he understands he's not, um, you know, he's he's not built like Jordan Matthews. I mean, is a guy that he's a big, strong, you know. But uh, some of those some wide receivers just don't have that frame. I mean, he's smart about it. So um, I'm curious to see him in action, but I, I'm not worried about the the size. Uh, training camp just a couple of weeks uh, a couple of weeks away, as you well know. Uh, is there a particular player that you are excited to see to see what they could do when they're actually going up against NFL talent, albeit someone that's on their own team? <laughs> I, I mean, obviously, Jalen Hurts is is the easy answer. Um, I, I would say um, some some of the running backs like Carryon Johnson and, and Kenny Gainwell are guys I really want to see. Some of the younger wide receivers, Quez Watkins, Hightower, Fogum. I want to see how they kind of take that next step in, in their second year. Fulgham technically is his third year, but he, he didn't play as a, as a, as a rookie. Um, so I would say those guys, the young, the young guys, and then maybe on defense guys like uh, Davion Taylor, um, Kayvon Wallace, just, you know, those guys going from year one to year two, that's where you look for the big jumps. So I think, you know, in training camp, you hope to see the start of that process. I know everyone's, curious is how I'll put it when it comes to Nick Sirianni, when it comes to Jonathan Gannon, what type of defense you're going to see, what type of offense you're going to see. What are you expecting? Let's start with the defensive side of the ball. What are you expecting to see as far as a defensive philosophy goes? Anything we could draw a comparison with, with Jim Schwartz, anything like that, or anything we've seen in Philadelphia before? I just don't know. Honestly, I mean, they, they've been, <clears throat> excuse me, they've been so vague talking to them. Um, you know, we're going to attack, you know, I mean, what's, what does that mean? Uh, so until we see these first few practices, I think we'll learn a lot. Uh, from, I mean, they're going to be vanilla, obviously. They're, they're not going to give away too much, but I think we'll have a pretty good sense of what the philosophy is. I mean, all the defensive coaches talked about how they're going to, you know, they're going to run the system. Even Gannon said, I don't have a, I don't have a scheme. My scheme is dependent on the personnel. I don't believe that for a second, but I do think once he sees what he has, you know, he's going to tailor his, you know, what he does to, to his personnel to a great extent. Um, I really don't know. I, I don't think anybody knows. And I think that's, that's what's going to make this, this camp so much fun, seeing this defense take shape and, and seeing, you know, how he mixes things up. I, I think when you have a defensive line like this, it really gives you the flexibility. This is a this is a, a top three or four defensive line in the league. It's the one area where you're like, you know what? They're they're set there. They're really good. Um, so, I, I think that enables you to do more. As far as I mean, that's the reason Jim Schwartz didn't like to blitz. He he thought I could get pressure with my guys up front. If you can't get pressure with Barnett, Sweat, Kerrigan, and and BG, you know I, I don't know how you're going to get pressure. So I, I think you're not going to see a ton of blitzing from Gannon either. But uh, ask me in a month and, and we'll have a better idea. I'm sure. Uh, what do you make I'm not of I agree to do the show again in a month? I'm not saying <laughs> wait, I thought I, I thought we already no. confirmed. A no, month it's a today. hypothetical. Ask me again. <laughs> I will. I absolutely will. Uh, with, uh <laughs> when it comes to Nick Sirianni, what do you make of not naming Jalen Hurts the starter? Purely gamesmanship, everyone's got to compete. What do you what do you make of him just not saying, Oh yeah, Jalen Hurts is a starter? Well, he, you know, how he kind of did in one of the interviews, I forget which one, but yeah, I, I don't know. It doesn't bother me. I understand what he's doing. Um, you know, he just wants this competition in every position. Obviously, Jalen Hurts is, is the guy moving forward for at least this year. Uh, and, you know, he, I think we all understand that. But, I mean, this is his philosophy. We're going to compete at every position. So, um Jalen understands the situation. Hey, if he's terrible in training camp, I guess, you know, I mean, if he's like world-class historic, like some of the, you know, some of the quarterbacks we've seen, like Clayton Thorson, if he's that bad, you know, maybe you'll see Nick Mullins as the opening day starter. I doubt it greatly, but uh, there's really nothing to gain by saying Jalen Hurts is the guy at this point. Um, 
he understands the situation. He's a competitor. Um, I kind of think he'd almost rather not have that out there. I think he just wants to go in hungry uh, with a lot to prove and, um, you know, and, and go to work. When it uh, when it comes to really how this team has kind of put things together in the offseason, we're still looking at the cornerback position thinking, well, who's going to play opposite Darius Slay? Is it somebody on this roster that's going to play opposite Darius Slay as a starter? Or is it someone they're going to go outside and get to bring in, you know, kind of late in training camp? Yeah, it's a great question. I mean, I've said all along it's going to be someone from outside, but we're running out of time. Uh, I, I still think there's a chance that wherever Ertz ends up, you get a, quarter, a corner from that team. Um, that's certainly possible. Uh, but we're, we're like three weeks out of training camp. And I would think if they were going to sign somebody, they would have done it by now. They don't have a ton of money, uh, you know, cap space. So it's it's a tricky thing. I just don't think you can go into a season with Avante Maddox or Michael Jaquette or, um, you know, Kev, Kevin Seymour, one of these guys. I just don't think you can do it. I, I think we, we learned last year Avante Maddox is not an outside cornerback. And I, he's a nice player, I think, as a third corner, as a slot, maybe a, a backup safety. Uh, he's not an outside corner. And, you know, Jaquette might be – I mean, he's a guy that battles and, and plays hard and – uh, I just don't know. He might be physically too limited to to do it. Um, I still think they're going to go outside and get somebody. I have to. You're an Eagles writer, so I have to ask you about Zach Ertz during this interview. Does this get resolved? Does he start the season with the Eagles? Does he make it through training camp and then get traded right before the season? How do you see the Zach Ertz situation get resolved? Well, it's been, gosh, it, it's been six months, and I, I really think they owe it to Zach Ertz. Now, I think there's some players you just treat differently. I mean, this guy had a game-winning catch, touchdown catch in the Super Bowl. There's not a lot of Eagles who've done that. There's one. And I think he's an, he's an all-time great. Um, he's meant so much to this franchise on the field, off the field. Uh, I, I just don't think you hold this guy hostage any longer. And, you know, if it costs you a seventh-round pick or a sixth-round pick, uh, you know what? That's the cost of doing business. Let him get on with his life. Uh, if he really doesn't want to be here, then don't don't drag this thing out into into camp where it's going to be a distraction. Whether he shows up or doesn't show up, it's going to be a distraction. Uh, he doesn't want to be here. He doesn't want to be in training camp. Um, he's you know, he, he's you know, he could be fined if he's not here um, unless they can work out a situation where Zach is like, you know what? And it makes sense for him to want to be here because if he gets cut, that eight and a half million dollar base salary disappears. So if he's upset about his contract and the offer that they made him last summer, well, if if he goes somewhere else, he might make three million, three and a half million. He's making eight and a half million if he stays here. So they want him here. It makes sense for him to want to be here. You'd think they'd be able to figure this thing out and work out a deal that that works for both of them, but it doesn't look like that's going to happen. Uh, the last thing they need is for this thing to drag into training camp through preseason games. You know what? Give him his freedom. Let him get on with his life. Find a new team, and and you move on with Goddard. Easy enough. Uh, once again, your most recent article right now on NBCSportsPhiladelphia.com and the My Teams app, Ruben Frank. Our expectations on the Eagles wide receiver, Devontae Smith, too high. Make sure you check out that story. I have to ask you this last question, though, because it's one of your most popular posts that you you always have on NBC Sports Philly and the My Teams app. Rube's 10 observations. Generally speaking, Rube, because I know you're a very observant individual, how do you determine what goes in the 10 observations and what doesn't? How do you pick? Well, I, I just start writing down observations till I have 10, and then I just, I'm done. I mean, it's not rocket science. It's not like I have, like, well, you know, you hear, like, bands, they're putting an album. Well, we had 30 tracks, and we had to narrow it down to 12. No, right. no that's not me. I, I, it's, it's not like I have 30 observations. I'm like, oh, let me figure out what my 10 best are here. No, no. I'm, I'm like, scrambling. Like, I'm, like, there's been days, like, in this time of year, Farzy, this time of year in June and July, when there's nothing going on, I'm at like three, and I'm like, I'm, I just, where am I going to get another observation? So you run to Starbucks, you, you go to a concert, you get come up with some more observations, and you write a story. When in doubt, like write about Jordan Matthews. Right, right, <laughs> there's, there's certain guys, like you know, write about Nick Foles. There's certain guys that are their careers are so bizarre and interesting. You know, right? Uh, you can always write something about, uh, you know, like 
I, I found this guy. I was writing my observations this week, and I was dying. I had nothing. And I found this guy, <laughs> Ernie Steele. Mark, have you ever heard of Ernie Steele? Only because I read your 10 observations. <laughs> right? How cool is that? The dude's got the highest punt return average in NFL history. He's got the highest rushing average by a running back in Eagles history. He had 20, 24 interceptions. He returned punts. He returned kicks. He was a D-back. He was a running back. He kicked an extra point once. And how is this guy not in the Eagles Hall of Fame? I don't know, my friend. I don't know. Just food for thought, though. Maybe one oh, time man. do a, a list of, like, top ten bars you miss the most in Philly that aren't around anymore. Oh, man. Maybe. I, I, I asked Ray uh, Ray D the other day about Ernie Steele because I was like, I'd never heard of him. He says, yeah, you know, interesting thing about Ernie Steele. Um, and his, he retired after 1948, after they won the championship. He had an interception in the fourth quarter of the NFL championship game. He should be in Eagles Hall of Fame. But Ray said the next summer he was driving out to training camp, and he's like, he was halfway across the country. He's like, I don't want to play anymore. He just turned around, drove home to Washington, never to be heard from again. That's amazing. Um, but just real quick, for the record, what bar do you miss the most in Philadelphia? What bar? Yeah. What bar that closed? Yeah. Um, like maybe one around 8th and Fitzwater. I don't know. <laughs> Vesuvio. Yeah, I miss Vesuvio, man. We had some good times there. <laughs> we absolutely did. <laughs> Two-gallon vodka tonics <laughs> on my birthday. <laughs> Yeah, Jerry, Jerry had a hookup. Yeah, uh, good man. Yeah, get like, Ruben. A, like a carafe of vodka tonic. <laughs> uh, yes, we did have some good times. But you but... know what else? You know what I really miss is the boot and saddle. Which have you ever been to the boot and saddle? I've only driven by it on Broad Street. On Broad Street, South Broad. Um, you know, one of the one of the probably one of my favorite, one of my two or three favorite music clubs in the city, and a really good bar as well. Um, and the best tater tots, man. And they and they closed during the pandemic. Uh, same owners as Union Transfer, so at least Union Transfer is still open. But man, I loved I loved uh, Boot and Saddle. I got to play there with Dave Hawes a couple nights, which is really cool. That's a, you are a man for all seasons, my friend. A man for all seasons. Ruben Frank, NBC Sports Philadelphia, the My Teams app as well. Make sure you check them out on there. Keep up to date on all things Eagles with Ruben Frank, as you should be doing already, people. Rube, thank you so much for joining us, man. Appreciate it. Anytime, Mark. The great Ruben Frank, NBC Sports Philadelphia, joining us here on the Rothman Orthopedics Guest Line. My thanks once again to Ruben Frank joining us here on the Rothman Orthopedics Guest Line. I do think you owe it to Zach Ertz, and I, I don't use that phrase a lot, owe it, because nobody owes anybody anything, right? But he won a Super Bowl for you. <laughs> he got the game-winning touchdown, as Ruben Frank pointed out. Uh, and I love how he broke down his article regarding Devontae Smith and again, Ruben goes into writing the piece with the idea that, well, no matter what, like even if every pick, every wide receiver pick for the last 18 years or from 2000 to 2018, if every pick from 5 to 15 was a complete bust, you still have to judge Devontae Smith based on this, his own isolated career, which you do have to, to do to everybody. Because whenever you look at the numbers and the trends – they always tell what happened in the past, and obviously you're trying to use the, the past to predict the future. But everybody's their own isolated career. Everyone's their own individual. Devontae Smith is that same thing. So I don't. you look at the numbers and say, okay, that's the trend. Cool. But none of those measure what Devontae Smith has done or is going, or what he's going to do in the league. So for me, hey, have at it, Devontae Smith. Have yourself a nice little career, and you know what? Buck the trend, if you will. Uh, thanks again to uh, our good friend Ruben Frank joining us there. And speaking of uh, Rothman Orthopedics, new sponsor to the program. Uh, by the way, I'm uh, trying to do something involving Rothman Orthopedics for tomorrow's Farsi in the Field. So stay tuned. All right. Uh, when you have orthopedic issues, you need a physician who eats, sleeps, breathes orthopedics. You need an exceptionally specialized Rothman Orthopedics physician. They not only specialize in orthopedics, but each of their physicians only focuses in on one area of the body, which means you can have confidence that you'll get past the pain and be what you were. Learn more at RothmanOrtho.com. That's RothmanOrthopedics.com, the official orthopedic uh, partner of your Phillies, Eagles, and Sixers. Check out, check out RothmanOrtho.com. Dot com. How about our good friends over at Steak and Main at SteakandMain.com? Uh, you always check out SteakandMain.com for all the great things going on at Steak and Main in the heart of Northeast Maryland. Whether you dine in a more upscale steakhouse or casual bar and patio, you'll find the highest quality of prime meats, fresh seafood, world-class oyster bar, and freshly prepared 
Sushi. All that in an extensive wine list that includes their own Cavada Cellars wines. Open every day for lunch, dinner, and Sunday brunch. Check it out. Steak and Made in Northeast Maryland. Voted number one per, uh, place for steaks in America by the Travel Channel and the Cooking Channel. Check them out for yourself at SteakandMain.com for more information. Highly recommend the two-pound tomahawk steak. Feel like a man. It's a, or, 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 or a lady. There you go. Uh, it's a delicious item. Uh, PHLSportsNation.com. PHLSportsNation.com, enhancing your Philadelphia sports fan experience. If you're checking out uh, different sites, uh, different things to follow, make sure you follow Philadelphia Sports Nation, a local Philadelphia sports site covering your favorite teams across blogs and all social media. PHLSportsNation.com, once again, enhancing your Philadelphia sports fan experience. And our good friends over at Fan Up. Download the Fan Up app right now on the App Store and start having some fun here because the days of playing fantasy sports alone are over. Now it's all right there on one app where you can trash talk with your friends, send gifts back and forth. You can take challenges issued by FanUp themselves, win hundreds of dollars worth of gift cards that they have going on there. You also fill out your profile so they know what brand prizes you're after. If you're into Jordans, I always mention I'm into DeWalt tools. So there you go. I like myself some DeWalt tools. Uh, and you make sure you go there. Fill all that stuff out. You could rise on the Fan Up leaderboard by entering their super fun daily and weekly contest. Answer fun questions. You could rise on their leaderboard. That way, squad up with your friends and win even more. I do it with my friends. It's a great time on the Fan Up app. Download the Fan Up app now in the App Store and use promo code FANUP. That's promo code FANUP to get 2,000 bonus points right out of the gate to get you started. That's Fan Up. Just be fans. Now it's time for everybody's favorite part of the Farsi show, the social media check-in brought to you by our friends at Sky Motor Cars and skymotorcars.com. Good golly, people. <laughs> Hammering my friend Rube. Rube's, yeah, Rube's your every man. Rube's your every man. Don't you want a guy like that covering the Eagles? Love Rube and Frank. Uh, let's start it off at the top as we always do. Thomas McKeon, what's up? Oh, what's up, bud? Welcome back. He says he was on the uh, the pod for a while because of work. Pff, work. Who works? Uh, anyway, welcome back to the live stream here. Uh, I like when you guys welcome each other in. This is nice. Brian welcomes Tom back in. Tom is back in. That's nice, Brian. Uh, Benny say, what's up, Farzy? What's up with you? Uh, <laughs> big fan of Farz, not Sealski. <laughs> and we're off. Uh, Thomas said, uh, Wheeler of all people to lose. See, that's what I'm saying. Sometimes baseball is just really weird. And you look at a, a pitching matchup, because if I, if I ask you who's going to win a ball game, I just blanket statement, who's going to win the ball game? What's the first thing you're going to ask me? Oh, who's pitching? Right? That's, that's what matters. You have one of the best pitchers in baseball, arguably the second best pitcher in the National League, in, in, uh, in, in Zach Wheeler. He's starting the game for you against some middle-of-the-road dude. And sure enough, Wheeler gets dinked and ducked around the field. Next thing you know, he allows five runs, and the Phillies lose a game. So that's uh, that's uh, tons of fun. Benny's also checking in saying, uh, I think Vinny Velo uh, des uh, deserves an all-star start. Uh, yeah, uh, April saying, in, uh, you know good and well he would choke if that happened. I can confirm that. I can confirm that. Uh, Dan's checking in saying, and now Wheeler. Yeah, Wheeler is always, is, is the problem yesterday. Uh, I feel like he hits a grand slam every night. I assume that's Andrew McCutcheon. Julian's checking in. He was, uh, he was talking about Andrew McCutcheon and how great a season he's having power-wise. 15 home runs uh, for uh, Andrew McCutcheon as of last night. That's pretty amazing. April's also checking in, telling Dan, uh, they come in threes, so the Phillies crap in the bed was your third thing. Or Sealski, take your pick. I haven't seen Sealski on a second time yet. And when I do, oh, man. I'm going to see if my buddy will be up for a little uh, WWE reference. Trying to turn heel, even though you guys already turned him heel. Uh, <laughs> Louise, he's checking in. Storms are allegedly coming today. Is that when it's happening? Today? I really hope not. Last week, I didn't do a, a Farsi in the field because of the weather. I was hoping it would be put off till Friday. But if it's supposed to be storming, and yes, Luigi, I know me doing this right now, looking up the weather for today, is all the more argument for me to get a weather lady, a lovely weather lady on the program. Uh, let's see here. Partly cloudy, partly cloudy, partly cloudy, partly cloudy, partly, 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 partly isolated thunderstorms. Of course. Showers, rain, cosarnet. All right. Well, there's your weather report. It's going to rain. Damn it. I had something fun planned for Farzee in the field. Eh, maybe I can still get it done. What's today? Thursday? 
Friday? Air it Monday? Yeah, we'll work on something. Anyway, uh, let's get back to our, ch- our social media check-in. Luigi, that was all for you. I hope I looked good doing it. Uh, Dan's checking in. Is Sealski on today? No. Mark said he might be. Not today. And in the not-too-distant future, I hope. Uh, let's see. Well, what do you think of JT calling the team boring or implying it? Uh, well, I think we all – I was going to get to that in our morning rush, but it's a good – I'll get to it right now. I'm all for it. <laughs> Sometimes you have to have a little – I just find it's a little interesting that you had a situation where he said – where he implied it uh, after you scored 15 runs in a ball game, And then you go into last night's game, and JT Room Utah, I believe, had another RBI last night. Uh, Bryce – I know he scored a run. Uh, Bryce Harper had another RBI last night. Uh, and McCutcheon had the home run. But when it comes to this team overall being boring or overall just not having a lot of life, I think they're trying to change that. And I know a lot of people can look at things like the the home run hat that they wear now, that, uh, that, that like bamboo, whatever it is, hat, a straw hat. Like I know people looking at that and saying, stupid, I'll concentrate on playing the game. That's part of the game. That's trying to keep it light, trying to keep guys loose so they're not grabbing the bat too tight when they're in their batter's box or they're not, you know, botching plays in the field as much as they have been, anything like that. I think they're trying to inject some of that life, some of that passion for baseball back into this team. And that's what's so important about this. Is it shouldn't be important about a series with the Cubs who have been one of the worst teams in baseball over the last month of the season. But when you talk about this particular series before the All-Star break, you got a three-game set going up against Fenway, against the uh, Red Sox at Fenway. You got to win at least three out of four in this series. And that was so important about the first two games. You had laughers, essentially. You had fun games. You were pitching, you were, you were facing a guy, an uh, infielder, at the end of the first game. And Hoskins went deep and Bohm went deep. And you just padded your stats a little bit. You got your confidence even higher. That's great. And then Hoskins hit another home run the following game. And you have a laugher with 15, uh, 15 runs scored. You need games like that to make you feel better about yourself, basically. You also need series like this to make yourself feel better. If they lose game four of this series and they only split with the Cubs, then all the momentum, like all the momentum is not out of the blue. All the air is not out of the bloom because you lost one game to the Cubs. If you go to this series and you win three or four against the Cubs, you still feel pretty good about yourself because what did you do? You did what you were supposed to do against a bad baseball team. You won the series three games to one. I'll take that going into Fenway, going into the star break. I'll take that. And I think that's what JT Romuto is getting at. Is this you got to build some fun, you got to build some momentum, and carry that into the second half of the season, and they can go from there. Uh, Reese just tries. Luigi, I'll say Reese tries, but he's like an awkward middle schooler in a school play reading off a script. <laughs> um, yeah, I. Who did we get in the? Oh, Matt Breen. We were talking about this. Reese has been appointed kind of the de facto leader of this team because there's nobody stepping up. Bryce Harper should be, but Bryce Harper is also a, a free agent that was signed here to Philly. Reese Hoskins is the guy that came up through the Phillies organization. He's a guy that started out like gangbusters. He's a guy that's already been in the home run derby, whatever. Like this is a guy that you should be looking at as your leader. And he's always the guy that's not afraid to talk to the media, not afraid to send a message to the clubhouse, anything like that. I would love for Reese to take more uh, more of a role, but that's not going to come unless he's an, an all-star player type of guy, unless he is the, the perennial all-star type of guy. And that's not going to happen until he starts hitting more consistently. And now not just home runs, but like he has been in years past, at least getting on base. If you're telling me he's getting on base at uh, 365 or 370 and he's got 20 home runs, then we're talking about a much different Reese Hoskins. Uh, Rube. <laughs> Rob's calling out Rube for being on the show. Just Rube the machine. He is a machine, a numbers machine for sure. Covering the Eagles since the early uh, the, the, the 80s, as a matter of fact. A uh, lot of <laughs> you guys are <laughs> suggesting blame Sealski t-shirts. God bless you. Dan is seconding that notion. I like April's idea of blame Sealski shirts. Uh, what else do we have here? Rube is the goat. Kevin, I agree with you. Free Zach Ertz. I agree with you, Kevin. A lot of fine commentary. Free Ertz. Protest outside Sealski's house. You guys are damn ridiculous. Uh, oh, far, or, uh, the Inside Birds is checking in. What's up, Inside Birds? The Farzy Show is going on. I wish we were getting a weather girl named Elsa Luigi. Maybe it's only because I am uh, I have a, a soon to be two year old that we went through probably the first year of her life of watching Frozen 
nonstop as one of the movies, one of the only things she would like sit still for a second and just like stare and think, think it was amazing. Maybe a year and a half. I feel like it was about six months ago that she transitioned from uh, the, 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 the Frozen world and she got out of Frozen 1 and 2 and now she was really into Coco. She loves Coco. Uh, if you haven't watched Coco, it's a phenomenal movie. And actually, my love of the movie Coco, Disney's Coco, uh, it, uh, it it actually hurt my appreciation for the movie Luca, which if you haven't seen it yet, Disney's new movie L- Luca, uh, it, 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 I, I mean, I'm not killing, I'm not, I'm not revealing anything. This is about uh, sea monsters that turn into like two little boys when they come to land. And it takes place in the Italian Riviera. And I, I, I like the movie. But, like, Coco had so much Mexican culture and folklore in it, and, the, the, like, I never heard of sea monsters growing up with, with Italian folklore. Like, every culture's got sea monsters that's, that's at all near, near water. So, whatever. I still liked Luca. I liked it a lot. But I, I just, Coco had so much. Like, I learned about Mexican culture. I didn't learn anything about Italian culture in this one. But anyway, uh, still a good movie. Very much appreciate that. Uh, Dan Schwartz checking. Coco was so good, but sad. Yeah, I guess. I guess it's not a spoiler. It's not a spoiler. <laughs> Silencio Bruno. Thank you. It's T bro. Appreciate you. Um, yes. Dan Schwartz. Coco. People tell me Coco is so sad. I, I found it the appropriate amount of sad. I, I, I thought I tugged at the heartstrings. I'm not going to ruin it. It takes place in Mexico. There's my spoiler alert right there. Coco says, why don't you just talk about the lion? <laughs> April, thank you. Disney, I think we all, I don't even want to, because that's even more sad. Everyone knows what happens at the beginning of Disney movies and why the kid's alone. That's what we know. That's what we know about Disney. At least that didn't happen in uh, Luca. And by the way, I, who doesn't want a Vespa? Show of hands in the chat. Do you want a Vespa? Anyway, Mark, I'm sorry that you're lost right there. Oop. <laughs> um. This- <laughs> April chiming in. Yeah, Disney hates parents. You are correct. Mark is saying that that he's that he's lost. I, see, this is the thing. If if you have if you don't have kids or your kids aren't into the Disney stuff, this is all the Disney stuff. It, it just controls my thoughts now. That's that's where I'm at in being a dad. Thanks to everyone that checked in there on our social media check in. Brought to you by Steak and Maine and SteakandMaine.com. Farzy loves crying kids. <laughs> What's the scene in Mallrats? Is it Mallrats? Where the big guy is no longer big. He's he's actually lost a lot of weight from Remember the Titans and American History X, where he looks at the little, he's staring at the thing uh, that's supposed to, I forget what they were called, but whatever. He stares at the little kid and just goes, there is no Easter Bunny. Kids, if you're watching, there is an Easter Bunny, and you enjoy that Easter Bunny. Uh, Mark Langer saying I uh, uh, he's 26 and single. No idea what's going on. We're just talking about Disney movies. If you grew up watching Disney movies, they haven't really changed much. As April pointed out so uh, accurately, Disney hates parents. True fact right there. Farzy has range. <laughs> All right. Thank you, everybody. Checking in on our social media check brought to you by Steak and at SteakandMade.com. Let's uh, move on now to our morning rush, brought to you by Sky Motorcars at SkyMotorcars.com. A couple of things to get to here, four things to be exact. One thing we're going to get into, game two of the NBA Finals tonight, 9 o'clock in Phoenix. Phoenix up one game to none. Dario, the homie, say it ain't so, Dario. ACL tear out for the remainder of the playoffs. Hoping it doesn't leak into next year, but it probably will Anyway, uh, I, you know, we all love Dario Saric. He's finding a nice little niche for himself there in uh, Phoenix. Uh, trying to do everything, scoring, rebounding, all that stuff. Solid defense out there in Phoenix. And it's just sad to see that he is uh, done after one game uh, in this uh, finals. Plays a, a big role there for Phoenix coming off the bench. Uh, Bucks, you know what they need to do tonight? If you look at the numbers, uh, we all know Chris Paul went off. I mentioned it yesterday, 32 points. It was a game high in his first ever finals appearance. That's incredible for Chris Paul. I'm happy to see that. I love Chris Paul's game. But uh, I believe he was 14 of 19 shooting. And he also had four threes in the game. Like, Chris Paul was on fire in that game. Bucks need to do something to stop him. And that's the most obvious thing I could say on this show today. Uh, but especially when he's shooting, what, 12 of 19, 14 of 19, whatever it was in game one. Uh, so Bucks and Suns uh, tip off game two tonight, 9 o'clock. Uh, I mentioned the Lightning yesterday. I, I couldn't imagine them winning two Stanley Cups, and obviously they did that. Now they've won back-to-back Stanley Cups, so now they've got three Stanley Cups. 
since the year what 2004 i believe it was when they ruined uh, my uh, my cousin andrea's wedding by having that game seven in uh it uh, was in in, in uh, tampa bay uh so uh, that was uh, that was pretty awful um so now the tampa bay lightning have three stanley cups in my lifetime while the flyers have zero in my lifetime that is uh england won their semifinal matchup against denmark 2-1 so they'll go on to face italia in the world uh excuse me in the uh euro championship game so that'll take place on uh, sunday at three o'clock i'm gonna try to make my way over to my friends over there at grand cafe lockwood one more time to uh watch that championship matchup and hopefully watch the uh the italians the azori win that game uh the match i told you i'm a big fan of the match if you haven't watched the match uh it's i highly recommend whenever they put it on uh, the tbs whatever it's fantastic tom brady i know he's the goat quarterback he's the greatest of all time But in terms of his social media presence, I really got to hand it to Tom Terrific. He took to uh, Instagram, took to Twitter as well yesterday and put out these posts regarding the the match. Aaron, Aaron, the greatest meme is Kepka and uh, uh, Bryson DeChambeau. Uh, Aaron hitting every fairway, uh, Aaron hitting every fairway and making every putt. Me, annoyed. So that's Tom Brady being annoyed. And then it just, uh, it keeps on keeping on. I believe this is the next one here. Yeah. Uh, TNT scheduling next year's tournament. <laughs> Phil, when they try to pair me with him for a third straight year. <laughs> and then Tom Brady just caps it off with this. Bryson and Aaron. Uh, I can't even see that. Do I have that down? It's coming up. Bryson and Aaron beating our heads in on the back nine memes and trash talk, not translating and to being good at golf. Like, I think we enjoy these things more than anything. I think if you're a golfer, you really enjoy seeing the pros, whether they're the British open or whatever, enjoying them look like you, which is just hacking up a golf course, basically just in the sand in the, you know, in rough, can't get out of rough. You see them at the top of the ball here or there. Like you can't, I eat that stuff up and watching Tom Brady try to play, play golf and watching him do that every once in a while, watching him miss putts, watching him misread a putt and all that stuff. Like that makes me feel a lot better. Like they, all right, you guys are human. You'd still kick my ass on a golf course, just like you would a football field, but I at least see you struggle a little bit more often than, uh, than I'm used to seeing you struggle. I'm seeing you get closer to the amount of struggling I do in my life when I take on an athletic endeavor. So that's how I feel when I watch things like the match. So hopefully you guys are enjoying that uh, whenever it does, in fact, come around. Uh, I, I got an email yesterday for a future Farzee in the field, and I'm hoping I can do this, and I think I can pull this off. It's just a matter of whether or not I can get internet connection because that's what it's all based on. But even if I can't, I'll record it on my phone and I'll upload it later. So there you go. But I'll do it in some way, shape, or form. Uh, we have brought you uh, Yakking on the Yak before or uh, Fishing with Farzee, whatever you guys like to call it. Uh, another edition of Fishing with Farzee might be coming up in the not-too-distant future. End of the month, I'm going to Colorado for my wife's family reunion. She's got family out there. They have this beautiful ranch in Colorado. They got horses. I'm hoping to do a show for you while I'm on horseback. And I'm hoping to do a show for you while I am fly fishing in Colorado. I have, I've only fly fished one time in my life. And I went with my dad. We went to little Lehigh up North a little bit. And I, I, I just remember thinking uh, this, this is dumb. <laughs> That's what I remember thinking. This is dumb. I am literally casting to an area of water that I see that there are no fish. And you just ha 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 ha. That's that, like an hour and a half, like that. And I'm like looking in the area. There's nothing going on there. Like Moana, there's no fish. All right, all right, enough Disney. Anyway, uh, let's get to our big bets. Our big bet segment brought to you by uh, the DraftKings and DraftKings Sportsbook, America's top-rated sportsbook app. Here's what I got for you in our big bet segment today. I'm going to double down on what I told you yesterday. We're going to go for it again tonight. I said that you got to find a way to stop Chris Paul. Eh, you're going to find a little way to stop Chris Paul, but you're not going to win the game. Here's what's not going to happen tonight. I don't think Chris Paul scores over 30 points tonight. I think Chris Paul scores around 22, 25 points tonight. And I think he doesn't have nine assists. I think he has about 12 assists tonight. So this is what I like. I like the double-double with Chris Paul tonight and the Suns beating the Bucks in game two. They go to Milwaukee. 
to play games three and four. Milwaukee wins those games. They go back for game five in Phoenix, and then we got ourselves a bit of a series. That's how I think we end up doing this series. But as far as the big bet goes for tonight, I like Chris Paul, double-double, and the win. So those are the numbers that I would take out on tonight's game. That's my big bet going into tonight's game uh, against the Milwaukee Bucks. So there you go. Uh, thanks for watching. Thanks for listening. My thanks to Ruben Frank for joining the show today to break down Devontae Smith and what the future holds for Devontae. Also, I, I found it very interesting. So Zach Berman joined us uh, on Monday. Ruben Frank joined us today. Both are of the school that Zach Ertz is granted uh, freedom. Now, Ruben Frank uh, says that it's not going to be granted uh, unless it is uh, the Eagles just cutting ties. Zach Berman is saying that it's not going to happen unless they find a trade partner. I would tend to agree with Zach's philosophy a little bit more than Rube's because, again, it comes down to that owing factor. And if you're Howie Roseman, the last thing you think you do is owe anybody anything, especially in this case. It's like the only person the Eagles ever felt like they owed anything to, in all honesty, was Nick Foles. And it was the Super Bowl MVP. Zach Ertz, game-winning touchdown of the Super Bowl, but not the Super Bowl MVP. So uh, I still think it's going to be more along the lines of waiting for somebody to balk at the trade and say, all right, you got me. Here's a fourth instead of a th uh, fifth, or here's a third instead of a fourth. And that's only going to happen, as we alluded to yesterday, if an injury takes place uh, on somebody's roster with the tight end. So that's the way I see it shaping up today. Thanks for watching. Thanks for listening. Thanks for downloading. Thanks for clicking subscribe uh, on YouTube as well. Jim Hyden produced the program, did a phenomenal job as per usual. This is a Buzz Sports and Entertainment production. Tomorrow, uh, more sports and Disney conversation, I promise you. Have a great day, everybody. We'll talk to you tomorrow. Take it easy.